<laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Terry Tucker, and I'm here to welcome you to the uh, first seminar of the 2023 for the Perspectives in, in Global Development Seminar Series. Uh, the primary sponsor for the series is the Department of Global Development, and uh, other supporting departments include uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, the School of Integrated Plant Sciences, and the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management. Uh, for those of you who are taking it for credit, either undergraduate or graduate credit, we'll defer all the housekeeping related to that until next week. Next week will be our first uh, uh, session for students only, registered students only. It'll be a discussion session. And then our talks will resume uh, uh, the week after that. So two weeks from today, uh, the, the weekly seminar talks will, will resume. Uh, we have people online as well. Last year, uh, the last two semesters, we've had uh, participants uh, online from 47 countries and almost 400 organizations around the world. Uh, and I expect that's going to continue uh, this year. So welcome uh, to those of you online as well. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, ask Professor Mario Herrero to do a proper introduction for our speaker today. Mario, thanks, Terry. Uh, you know, it's for me, it's a great pleasure to be introducing a, a very close friend of mine, uh, Philip Thornton, with whom I've worked for 25 years. Philip is one of the uh, leading experts around the world on issues related to climate change, and he. His work has been incredibly influential in uh, reports like the IPCC, and he's, he's actually been at the forefront of providing solutions also for, and, and policy recommendations for a range of donors and a range of uh, different people. He used to work for the CGIAR, for the International Livestock Research Institute, where he spent uh, a number of years. Uh, he also managed for for the CGIAR, the the climate change one, the climate change program uh, that was called CCAPS. Uh, he led all the all the policy. Uh, Philip is also a honorary professor, uh, and gladly he's doing a lot of work with us in the Department of Global Development, really looking at uh, issues around future technologies around smallholder farming. He spent working uh, in, in low and middle income countries the majority of his life. So he brings an enormous amount of experience uh, with him uh, for, for these kinds of things. So he, he's going to talk to us about what might it cost to reconfigure food systems. As you all know, we've been talking a lot about that, that we really need a, a very significant food systems transformation, uh, but a critical thing to make it happen is we need to understand, uh, well, yeah, how much money will we need to, to really make this something effective? Philip will bring us all the insights into the topic. Philip, the floor is yours. It's, it's a real pleasure that you're opening the seminar series. This, in this Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, Mario, for that very generous introduction. This is a, an outline of what I'd like to talk about. Can you hear me okay? Here's the mic. Um, just something very briefly about the food system challenge. You know, there's the, the challenges that are facing us in the global food system. A little bit about the motivation for this particular piece of work, something on the methods, on the results, and then importantly, I think, sort of what next? What are the next steps in this? And I'd like to acknowledge um, this was a, a paper that we published as a perspectives piece just earlier in, in January, um, and my co authors. And so a lot of this work was done um, during uh, our time at CCAFS, um, this, this program of the CGIAR looking at climate change, agriculture, and food security. So just briefly, I'm sure many of you will be more than aware of 
of many of these, these figures, but the scale of the food system challenge um, is really quite considerable and it's getting worse. So you can see the numbers here, 2 billion people lacking key micronutrients, such as iron and vitamin A, um, millions of children being stunted, wasting, um, 2 billion adults overweight or obese, um, and 88% of countries are facing a serious burden um, with either two or three of these forms of mal malnutrition, either overnutrition, undernutrition, or um, lacking micronutrients. And the question is, can the food system address the challenges, all these challenges, and still stay within planetary boundaries? This is a, this is a slightly old graphic now, but um, really showing um, the state of, of planetary boundaries overlaid with, in the stippling, you can see um, an estimate of the role of agriculture in pushing us over these particular boundaries. And so you can see particularly the ones in red, genetic diversity, the state of phosphorus, of nitrogen. And these are, um, we're at high risk of being beyond safe operating spaces for, um, for food systems. And agriculture is a large, uh, is a large contributor to those. And then it's not only at the global level where the challenges are. Um, this is some work, again, these, these are like a, a range of surveys that were done in the time of CCAPS um, in, in five regions. And you'll see um, these are the, the categories of di different types of households in different places. Um, and some of you may recognize these are the, the An Andrew Dorwood um, livelihood um, framework. But basically what I think the, the, the bottom line here is that we have very large numbers of households that are simply not really coping very well. Um, they're scraping by. So these are households that have five months or more per year with, with some kind of food deficit. Um, we have large numbers of households that are sort of just making do. And we have fairly high percentage of households that are basically looking for other alternatives to agriculture. So stepping out of agriculture, accumulating non-agricultural assets. And we have, there's a, a sort of a residue of, of farms, of households that are stepping up or intensifying using, um, for example, starting to use new, new varieties of crops, attempting to increase the production, the productivity of crops and livestock. That's going to be necessary in many of these, particularly in, um, in, in the Africa regions, population growth rates are still very high in the region of 2%. And so Sub-Saharan Africa is looking at another almost billion people by the middle of the century. How are these people going to be fed? And how can we scale up the livelihood positive changes that are happening, that, that can and that, that, that do exist and that we need to encourage? So in short, the food system, the global food system is, in, is, in, is facing big challenges. And over the last two or three years, I've counted at least 29 reports that have been produced by a whole range of, um, of different organizations on the urgent need to make big changes to the, to the food system. Um, from these, there are lots of suggestions on you know, what we should do, but there's much less on how do you actually do it? How do you implement these kinds of changes, and almost nothing on what, what's it actually going to cost to do this. Um, CCAFS was involved with, uh, which I call here the Steiner et al. report from 2020. This was basically a, um, a, a, one of these 29 reports, so being part of the problem, of course, um, but outlining action areas and 11 very concrete actions about um, what a large group of experts and, and panels and several background papers were produced for this, for this report, um, showing what were sort of the so-called best levers, or levers that these experts believed, this group of people believed, could actually bring about um, change, the type of scale that's actually needed. Steiner et al., um, it was led by 
um, Achim Sleiner, who is the, the, the director essentially of the United Nations Development Project um, program. And we had um, it was quite a large, a large number of, of eminent people um, who were advising on, on this. But the Sinai report doesn't contain anything about the costs of what these different actions might actually, um, what, what they might cost. And it seemed to us that even having an order of magnitude estimate would be extremely useful um, for really trying to, um, to, to, in the first place, to set up an idea of you know, what, what are the costs of transformation, um, and then hopefully using this to inform the discourse and also to drive action um, so that we're actually doing, doing things about, um, about the challenges. So very briefly, this was the um, this was the report, and it's available um, online. Um, Transforming food systems under a changing climate. It was put together by um, sort of a group of a large number of people, of partners, um, from a whole range of different organisations, um, and it sort of led to a um, to a report that's really built around um, sort of four sort of four themes. Firstly, is rerouting production systems or, or farming and um, farming systems onto sort of new trajectories that are more climate resilient, um, that are of lower greenhouse gas emissions. So rerouting, at the same time de-risking, so trying to address the issues of risk that face so many um, small-scale farmers in many countries of the world. At the same time, trying to reduce the emissions through um, either through dietary change or through um, um, technological change in, in value chains that reduce um, the, um, the emissions footprint of agriculture and food systems. And then over at the top, having working on the enablers of change because you may have technological um, um, or technology changes, but there are many things that need to go in concert with that. So things such as you know, what about the finance? What about the regulatory frameworks that may need to be put in place and so, and so on and so forth. And I apologize, the, these are the next two slides are rather text dense. Um, that uh, this, this will, the presentation will be, um, it will, will make it available afterwards. So you're, um, you're, you're welcome to, to look at it in more detail. We just really wanted to throw up the 11 actions that, um, that we'll talk about how we went about costing these. So under the basic area of rerouting farming and rural livelihoods to new trajectories, um, there are three actions, one to do with um, really trying to stop agricultural expansion into high carbon landscapes. So that particularly um, in the forest margins and also the ex exploitation of peatlands. So the things that you need to do to prevent that. Then enabling markets and public sector actions to incentivize climate resilient practices. Um, so bringing large numbers of farmers into um, climate resilient and nutritionally appropriate markets through increased profitability market development. Then the third one, prosperity through mobility and rural reinvigoration. So building attractive rural livelihoods. Um, and so this would include um, where, where it's appropriate, promoting people to exit from agriculture into new livelihood activities, um, through creation of new rural jobs and investing in local infrastructure, for example. Under de-risking, um, one of the actions is around um, using early warning systems to secure resilient livelihoods and, and value chains. Then also helping farmers to make better decisions um, through the use of appropriate climate services. So information about when um, um, ICT enabled bundled advisory services about when to plant, um, what type of inputs to use and so on and so forth. Then the third action area, reducing emissions through diets and, and in value chains. So the first one here, trying to promote healthy and sustainable climate-friendly diets. Um, so, for example, reshaping um, beef dairy consumption 
these are very, very specific. These are some of the very specific actions um, that are that are included in the report. Three point two is around reducing food loss and waste. So um, actions to try to targeting fifty percent reduction in in major supply chains um, where both greenhouse gas emissions are and, and loss or food loss food loss or waste are, are high. And then the fourth area is around these um, realigning policies, finance, and, um, and knowledge. Um, so 4.1 is you know, what are the policies that, um, that need to be put into place to really foster these kinds of changes? Um, what about sustainable finance, um, accessing the, the billions of, of dollars that's required? Driving social change for more sustainable decisions given that um, there's a lot um, sort of social movements um, and young people um, getting them to sort of uh, uh, to, to move um, to, to sort of to change, um, to change outlooks uh, and hopefully change behavior. And then transforming innovation systems. So the very way that agriculture research for development is actually carried out, it could be made much more effective, much more efficient, um, and so these were, these together make up the, um, the 11 actions. When we come to start thinking about how we might cost what some of these might actually take, um, again, in the Steiner report, it recognizes very well that there are different types of farmers um, with very different asset bases, with very different objectives. Um, and so the idea being that for for example, conventional large-scale commercial producers, um, the, there may be a, a whole set of interventions that then move them down towards at the bottom here, showing the sort of the changed production systems um, in 10, 20, um, 10 or 20 years, for example. So for conventional large-scale commercial producers, moving gradually to a, a greater focus on um, environmental um, the, or trying to reduce the environmental externalities associated with um, commercial production. And then similarly for some of these other farmer types, moving through using a whole different set of different interventions um, and moving them onto more resilient and more sustainable um, production system. As part of the report, um, just basically so that we were able to break down um, the, uh, the, the different pathways um, in, and, and the different numbers of, of farms, we went through an effort to try to come up with estimates of the number of farms in each of these different pathways, so these different types of farmers by region, um, using a, a whole set of different proxy um, variables. So we came up with something like there's about 590, farm, 590 million farmers globally. Um, so this was based on a very comprehensive um, paper by um, Louder and others. Um, we updated these numbers somewhat. Um, and then using a whole range of spatial proxies, tried to break them down um, into um, the total number of farms by region and then by the different types of farmers. Another way that we tried to, um, to break down the information in, in the study was identifying where the areas of high exposure um, to particular climate hazards um, coupled with high levels of, of farmer vulnerability. And so this, this shows the climate hazards that we were looking at, um, high climate variability, um, reductions in the growing season in the coming years, high temperatures during the growing season, and then areas where you have a combination of, um, of two or more of these particular climate hazards. So in other words, these are areas that are both vulnerable, um, well, farms are, uh, farmers are, uh, are vulnerable, but also combined with very high climatic risk. So in the study itself, um, these were the, the basic steps. Um, trying to identify, so the first step was really, we had these 11 actions in the, in the Steiner report. 
um, and then trying to turn them into things that we could actually measure or that we would actually have, um, we could find cost information from. Then from quite a large literature, literature search, um, we tried to collect cost data for each of these, um, each of these actions. Um, and then these, if we were able, if the information existed, we would categorize these um, by country or continent so that we get a better representation of the regional differences um, between, the, between the regions. Then transforming these cost data into comparable units, um, and I'll illustrate that a little bit later on, evaluating and analyzing the unit costs and then applying the selected unit costs to the, to the target areas that are in the Steiner report. As I mentioned, um, trying to do this in relation to the, these five different path, pharma pathways um, and areas of high exposure and vulnerability to climate hazards. Um, we found there's quite a lot of, um, or as I mentioned before, there's actually a, quite a lack of um, detailed cost data um, and trying to make some of these cost data comparable so that we could um, actually use them in the, in the study was quite, was quite a challenge. So as an, for examples of some of the proxies that we ended up using. Um, so for action one, 1.1, this is trying to halt um, expansion of agricultural land into high carbon um, landscapes. Um, so the, the target in the Steiner report is avoiding conversion of 250 million hectares of forests and 400 million hectares of peatlands. So what we did here was then search the literature and we found, managed to find estimates of either well, restoration or prevention costs on a per hectare basis per year for forests and peatlands. And then we scale those per hectare costs to the, tar to the target in the Steiner report. And so basically for each of the actions, um, we came up with a proxy and for some of these, of course, it's not possible to actually come up with um, sort of very with, with directly um, um, directly relevant um, examples. But we did pretty much. The, I think that we did the best. We did the best we could. Um, so another example um, on the mobility and rural reinvigoration of Action One Point Three. Um, there's estimates in the literature on the cost of, say, in infrastructural development, um, the cost of safety net policies, and then having information from the literature, then we could upscale to the actual number of um, people or close to the number of people that were in the Steiner targets. And similarly, for the other actions, I won't go through these in, um, in any great detail, um, but again, these are all um, for those of you who might be interested, these are all listed in the, um, in, in the paper. For the, the, these, um, the sort of the more policy related um, proxies, um, these were sort of very difficult to estimate because it's very hard to find direct costs for, for some of these. And so for example, on the, the realigning, the, the Policies Action 4.1, um, there's really very little information where you can get a direct estimate of what that's actually going to cost. So we used a prop, we managed to find a figure in the literature um, that basically said there's an additional percentage cost of climate proofing regional investments um, of something like 16%. So that 16% marginal cost is because of climate change um, into the next 10, 20 years. And so we then um, applied that 16% cost to all the other actions um, of, of the, the other 11 actions. Similarly, for, um, for finance, um, unlocking large amounts of money, um, it's basically a matter of can we estimate what are the costs or the possible costs of de-risking public and private investments? Um, we came up with some ways to, to do that. Um, very approximately. Um, social change, um, we, we used the proxy on the, what's the cost of educating um, students? 
multiplied by the proportion that's actually climate related and in the OECD and in the European Union. This is nowadays, it's um, supposed to be something on the order of 20%, um, which is supposed to be related to climate and environmental issues. Um, and so we use that as, a, a, as the proxy here. And so on and so forth for um, the, other, um, the other estimates. Um, just so here's an example of, of the way this would work. So action 1.1, so ensuring zero agricultural land expansion in high carbon landscapes. Um, these are the, the, we found for each of these, for the forage for um, reforestation and peatland and restoration, we found three estimates from the literature that are directly com comparable. So what we were looking for were amount of dollars per hectare per year. Um, and we found, so as shown here, so for forest, um, forest restoration, it's about just under $1,500 per year per hectare. Um, and of course, there's a, because these are all from different studies, there's a range of, um, a, a range of numbers, and the numbers in red show the standard deviation from these, these three. Um, these three estimates. And similarly for the peatland, and if you multiply it all out, the total cost um, for action 1.1 of about $750 billion per year. <coughs> and that, um, those costs were estimated and then allocated to spatially to the countries that we showed before, but on the basis of um, 11 deforestation sort of fronts that are, are identified by WWF. So again, this is using existing information to the sort of, to the best way that we could um, to actually target this particular action to the places where it was most needed or where it's likely to be most needed into the future. Similarly with peatlands, and there are global data sets um, that give you the information about um, the status of peatland and global um, greenhouse gas emissions from, from these. Just one more quick example. This is on Action 2.2. So this is taking climate services to scale. Um, again, we managed to find three estimates from the literature in terms of the number of dollars per farmer per year. Um, that's the cost of actually providing and climate service information, just about $12, um, $12 per farmer per year. So if we apply this to 200 million farmers, that's $2.4 billion per year. Um, that's the cost of implementing this action. If we then, um, for each of the, the 11 actions shown on the right, and the, the sort of the four action areas, then um, rerouting farming, that's over, um, that's, uh, that's over a trillion, that's, yeah, that's, um, that's over a trillion dollars per year to do all of action, that act, for, for these three actions. De-risking livelihoods is, um, these are um, 8 billion, um, because those are relatively, relatively, um, well, they're much cheaper um, actions to actually implement. Reducing emissions through diets and, and in value chains, about 48 billion per year. And then realigning the, the enablers of change, um, something like 200, 230 billion um, dollars per year. So if this, uh, this shows a, a, a breakdown, um, again, by region, and for each of the, each of the actions, um, and just in a way, the sort of the take, the take home from, from these costs is that in some of the regions, it's really the agricultural stopping agricultural land expansion in the high carbon um, landscapes can take more than 70% of the cost. And so that would apply to North America, Europe, Central Asia, and Latin America. Whereas in other regions, such as um, South Asia or Sub Saharan Africa, you can see that the difference between um, the there's much, there's much more of an even spread between um, these, these different actions 
in terms of the costs involved. These estimates obviously have some, um, some huge limitations. Um, despite the fact that we looked for um, you know, many, um, we looked through a lot, a lot of peer reviewed information. We found relatively few studies where we had sort of good comparable estimates of, of some of these costs. Um, I mentioned already that the, the problem with trying to come up with proxy variables for some of these costs was also quite a challenge. It's also worth pointing out that from some of these actions, there's likely to be synergies. In other words, maybe overestimating the costs. So for example, if there's a farmer and the, the cost of implementing, say, the climate smart agriculture um, and the way that it was done in the study, um, providing digital climate services um, or adaptive safety nets. In other words, there are probably going to be cost savings because many of these farmers would actually be the same they'd be the same farmers. And so therefore the costs of implementing um, all of these things would not necessarily, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't add up necessarily to, um, to, to the total. On the other hand, there were probably other, um, other actions where there actually could be trade-offs. Um, so as an example, trying to get climate smart agriculture implemented on 185 million farms globally, in the lower and middle income countries, that's probably going to raise in the short term, that may well raise greenhouse gas emissions, particularly if you're in places like many parts of sub Saharan Africa where soils are sort of old and weathered, and where you're probably going to have to use um, some level of inorganic fertilizer at least to get to move the system into a, um, into a better state. So that may actually increase in the short term, that may actually increase um, greenhouse gas emissions. Let's get back. Um, other caveats, um, the 11 actions, they're, in the, they're probably not all encompassing, but they, as I mentioned, they represent a sort of a best estimate of what's needed to get food system change actually rolling um, at, at, at scale. Um, there are questions around, well, all these actions probably need to occur, but would it, would, do they need to be done simultaneously or do they need to be sequenced? And I'll return to that just uh, a little bit in a minute. It's also very likely that there will be declines in costs per year through time just because of the spillovers from other, um, from, from changes in other sectors spilling over into the food sector. So that would particularly relate to, say, innovation in the energy sector may have a huge impact on um, what's actually going to be happening in the food sector or on um, in health and so on. And so we felt that there's very likely to be a decline in costs um, through time. So we're talking about a total of $1.3 trillion a year over the next few years. That's what this, this analysis is basically saying. And it's worth asking the question, well, is this even, is this realistic or is it even remotely feasible to think about meeting such costs? I think a couple of points. One is that as we come to know more about the impacts of climate change and climate change on food systems, these the, the costs of adaptation have been increased markedly through time. So the, the work that Parry did a, um, an early study, well, yeah, relatively early study, 2009, um, where the estimate of adaptation in agriculture, water, human health, coastal zones, infrastructure, so all of those different sectors um, was, was something in, in the order of 50 to 100, $170 billion per year. That's for all those sectors, um, whereas, 2019, um, adaptation investments in infrastructure were estimated to be something like $4 trillion per year. And so that's in a relatively short time frame. You can see that the costs of adaptation have been increasing um, enormously. And $1.3 trillion per year is a lot of money. There's no doubt about that. But then if you think about or compare it with some of other numbers around 
So the annual cost of um, or the annual monetary value of global food consumption is about $9 trillion per year. And so according to this analysis, then the cost of transformation is something only like 50, um, a mere 15% of that. Um, and a paper that Mario, well, a short paper that Mario and I did um, in 2020, um, just looking at the first four months of the COVID-19 pandemic, governments mobilized $9 trillion in four months for that was yes, and that was another existential, existential crisis. So yes, uh, 1.3 trillion is a great deal of money, but um, it's in the, in the broad, broader scheme of, of, of things, um, that sort of amount of money is, um, it's, it may be realistic to be thinking in those sorts of terms. What I presented is really, it's, a, it's just a, an exercise in estimating what the costs are. Um, what about the benefits of um, a food system reconfiguration? Um, these are estimates um, from the literature. So from the, from the human health perspective, um, there are likely to be benefits of at least a trillion dollars per year. Reducing food loss and waste. Um, FAO reckon that's around $2.6 trillion a year that could be saved. And then some of the, um, the environmental externalities associated with the current food systems. In other words, these are the environmental and human health impacts of um, or, or the costs that are not incorporated in, um, in, in food pricing currently of around $7 trillion per year. And that's just from the environmental side. So those are things such as reducing carbon and biodiversity losses, reducing the costs of air pollution, um, reducing fresh, fresh water use. And actually, if you, in, if you, in, if you include the externalities of um, improved human health, um, then that's another 11 trillion. So I think there's something like $20 trillion of externalities per year in our current food system. Just to finish on a couple of issues. Um, one is the finance gap. So how, how are we going to find, um, how are we going to find such a vast amount of money? Um, again, to put it in, into perspective, um, official development assistance in 2019 was $168 billion. Um, so what this analysis is suggesting is that we're looking at, or we may be talking of an order of magnitude increase in, in that amount of money. So where's that going to come from? Well, there were no, um, no terribly simple um, solutions. I mean, you can think around in terms of increases in, in, in official development and assistance. You can think in terms of increased climate finance from the public and particularly from the private sector, um, where um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of scope um, changes or increases in, in levies and taxes, um, and finally perhaps redirection or repurposing of existing finance streams. I mean, particularly in food system energy subsidies, for example, could these could these be repurposed um, to um, to sort of serve um, the objective of, of food system reconfiguration. But I mean, all of these are sort of highly politically charged. Um, and as I mentioned, there are no simple, no simple solutions for, um, for, for finding sort of vast amounts of money. The other issue I'd just like to raise is um, around sort of development pathways. Um, so, a lot of our analyses, I would say, and the, the analytical tools that we have to, um, to look at sort of what's happening with changes in, in food systems, we really think in terms of sort of like the end point. You know, we're here now, that's where we want to get to. But actually, for, um, it's really, we really need to understand how we can actually specify and implement what are the things we actually need to do to move from where we are to where we want to be. And thinking around those sort of development pathways, um, that 
this is a sort of a crucial area and there's been um i think there's a lot of work that needs to be done um in the future on on this so in terms of these 11 actions say what needs to be done right now compared with what could be done in say three years time or in five years time or in 10 years time um what are the incremental ways that we can move from where we are now to where we need to be um, and sort of um, and thinking thinking long and hard about that particularly because almost all kinds of change in whatever system you consider they're all off, they're almost always winners and losers and so for food systems obviously there's only so much that um because people's livelihoods and, and health and depend on them what are the kind of safety nets or what kinds of methods of compensation would be needed um, for those who lose out in the short term and by the same token um, if we're thinking around development pathways are from here to much better uh, more resilient more equitable food systems in the future um, we need we need to be able to monitor and to what's going on because otherwise how can we find out you know, are we moving in the right direction um, you know, are we moving at, the, at an appropriate speed and so monitoring the food system outcomes as a result of the changes that we are putting in place so these outcomes to do with nutrition the environment livelihoods the economy equity resilience and, and so on and so forth and so the need for comprehensive regular monitoring then becomes absolutely crucial um we're going to have a, a little bit on on next steps um basically just to, to because of time constraints one thing i think would be quite interesting to do would be to rather than doing a global analysis do take a, a say a, a fairly data rich environment a country such as kenya where there's quite a lot of information and estimate these costs at, a, at the national level um, and then see what the costs of implementing the this this kind of change agenda might be and then compare it with what actually what does the government of kenya um, they have nationally determined contributions under the paris agreement about how they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions through time they have a national adaptation plan which sets out how they want to um, how they want um, the, the 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 nation to adapt to climate change and see how the seeing what kind of comparison i mean is there any overlap at all between this kind of food system agenda with what's actually being proposed at the national level um, and then again is there some sort of scope to incorporate some of the actions into international de development plans and pathways and if they were then thinking about you no know, how could some of these things perhaps be funded um, on a sustainable basis so this this is the bottom line um, reconfiguring food systems may cost us 1.3 trillion although it's equivalent to 1.5 of the global gdp which is roughly 85 trillion dollars per year it's pretty clear that the cost of inaction will, will far, far outweigh the benefits. And it also underscores the absolute necessity of reducing greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as we can. Because if, if we don't do things, then these costs are only going to increase in the future. Thank you very much. That was super interesting, and uh, I'm sure that there's going to be many questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we have how long? About two minutes. We have about five minutes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for those that can stay, there may be another class coming in here, so we couldn't stay too long. But we did have okay. another five minutes for those who can. Right. Uh, questions from the floor or from Zoom. Okay. Okay. One of the slides mentioned urban horticulture, but I don't really understand how you reckon 
cities and urban people and urban food production might or might not fit in and how, you know, even in terms of nutrient dynamics, how uh, urban nutrients might fit into the whole picture. D do you have a sense of that? I think what might be your thoughts? Um, this is mostly around, yeah, I didn't explain um, the, the dietary, the dietary action. Um, that's mostly around um, getting people to modify or to move towards more, you know, more sustainable, more healthy, more healthy diets. So one of the costs I didn't mention was that this is based on is it's the um, we actually use one of the one of the estimates is the Lancet diet, and so what's the added what's the additional cost of um, moving people onto that diet compared with say the standard um, the standard diet. So these aren't. All the actions they apply to sort of different different actors in the in the food system, right? So certainly farmers are you know, crucially important, but there's also actions that relate to um, urban consumers as well um, as well as the, pol the policy and the finance um, actions that I showed. Um, I mean, just perhaps more generally, I mean, I think there there, there could well be a role for urban food production in particular situations into the into the future. Um, but that's that's not actually that, that wasn't incorporated in what we what we did here. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my name's Morgan. I was wondering what your opinion is on the land sparing versus land sharing debate. I know that's been a big topic as far as how we should address food system change. And it seems to me that the Steiner study took more of a land sparing approach to that debate. I'm not sure if your understanding of it is similar, but I'm wondering from your experience how you would predict those estimated costs would change if there was a land sharing approach taken um, to, to the analysis. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I would agree that I think the, the Steiner report was more about um, land, um, land sparing. Um, yeah, so I mean, the quick the quick answer is um, it's hard it's hard to estimate what the what the differences might be. I mean, I think I mean I think I would say that the I think the challenges that we face uh, are so severe that we probably need to you know, we need to do all kinds of uh, whole the whole bar the whole range of options that are that are available. And in some situations, that may well be you know, that may be land sharing, or maybe land sparing, um, attempting to move, um, or even decouple agricultural production from um, from sort of standard natural resources, land, um, for example. And then there's all kinds of you know, again, the Steiner report doesn't talk all that ex all that explicitly about um, some of these um, some of these. Sort of future technologies that could, could be you know, monumentally disruptive to existing food systems, but those those things are certainly you know, they're there, and they, there are opportunities I think for um, for exploiting some of those in, in particular circumstances. But I think everything we're going to need. Every, you know, there's no there's no one way to do this. I think we're going to need we're going to need to use um, sort of all all available resources. Yeah, and, and, and Morgan, I think that, uh, yeah, in, in some parts that would be possible and that might, that might bring the cost per hectare down a little bit, but, you know, maybe other costs are also incurred. So, you know, we would need to continue uh, what the land sharing uh, option would, would also. I have, uh, before I continue here, let me just check on Zoom. I see three questions here, uh, one from Norman Scott, 
Norman, would you like to have a to say something about your question? I see four here. I think they're able to yeah. Oh, they're not able to speak. Now it's a webinar oh. after the Zoom bombing last semester. <laughs> <laughs> right. Did the dietary action include plant-based and cell culture changes for the future? I, but, but you sort of answered that one, but perhaps yeah. a quick comment. Um, I mean, not, not explicitly. Um, but they, yeah, I mean, it could do. I think we're, yeah. yeah. Look, I think that we ran out of time, but yeah, a quick round of applause. For you. Thank you.